um, welcome to this month's construction cast. I used to say this week's construction cast, but we have moved to monthly now, um, or that's the aim at least. So this month we're talking about adjudication and it's our first anniversary. So um, thank you to everyone who's joined us over the past 12 months. Obviously, people are very excited this week in the news talking about the first anniversary of lockdown in the UK. This is actually the first anniversary of Construction Cast, which, um, as my wife said to me last night, which we must have started these quite early in the process. So I, I hadn't realised we'd started them this early. So um, we've probably had thousands of people over the last 12 months and definitely, I, I think, hundreds of speakers and subjects from CSR to diversity and adjudication to delay analysis. So thank you, everyone, for joining us for the journey. Hopefully, at some point in the near future, we'll be able to see some of you, at least, in, in flesh and in, in real life. And um, with a bit of luck, we might do something like Construction Cast Live or something like that. So um, look out for those sorts of things coming up. Um, so hopefully, as you know, Today's subject is adjudication. Um, there's been a few recent cases and we're going to have a whistle stop tour through through that. And we're going to look at some of the other issues around adjudication and the latest developments in it. We've got some brilliant speakers. So we have Lena Barnes, who is a solicitor on the construction team at Mills and Reeve. She specializes in both contentious and non-contentious construction law. And according to the Mills and Reeve website, she's a, her particular specialism is collateral warranties. She's also heavily involved in a lot of adjudications. Um, Sarah McCann is a barrister at Hardwick, a great speaker. And she uh, nicely is um, a member of Hardwick. And she, we, um, I'll get my words out, the first of the construction casts we ever did featured another barrister from Hardwick. So it's a nice coming full circle after 12 months, we have another barrister from Hardwick with us. Um, Sarah is both an adjudicator and counsel representing clients in adjudication. So she'll be able to give us a good range of perspectives from both sides of the fence. Uh, Jennifer Jones is a barrister at Atkin Chambers, one of the leading sex construction barristers in London. She represents clients both in the UK and around the world. Um, so she'll be able to give us a perspective on the international side of things as well as the UK. Um, Jennifer, along with David Oram, who we'll come to in a second, worked on the Moticus case, which we're about to discuss, which is one of the features of this uh, session today. And finally, David Oram, who is a partner at law firm Hill Dickinson. Um, David has over 34 years experience of working in construction matters and also is a contentious and non-contentious, so works on the, the, the getting things right and when things have gone wrong side of the world, and uh, worked with Jennifer on the Motica's case. So we'll start with Lena. Um, Lena, statutory adjudication is familiar to all of us, I think, in the UK, um, but it'd be quite nice to get a little bit of background if we can, and perhaps a look at, because I think there are some international attendees on the call, a look at the differences between statutory and contractual adjudication. So would you be able to give us a little bit of an overview? Yeah, thanks, Stuart. So um, adjudication has been with us for quite a while and it um, originally started in 1998 in the UK. And that um, comes from the Housing Grants and Construction and Regeneration Act 1996, which as it's a mouthful, we call it the Construction Act. Um, so the Construction Act applies to construction contracts. So basically that's all design and construction contracts, including professional appointments, which um, relate to construction operations. Construction operations is also defined, but it's quite wide. So you are looking at most forms of construction and engineering operations, but there are some exceptions and that's an area that everyone needs to be aware of. So you're looking at things like mining, nuclear and power generation they're not considered construction operations. And there are some specific exclusions, for example, residential occupiers, adjudication doesn't naturally apply to them. Also, your construction operation has to be in England, Wales or Scotland. So as Stuart said, we have a statutory right to adjudicate and that's where it comes from the Construction Act. And because of that, the decision was made that you cannot avoid it and you can't postpone that right. So whilst you are free and able to, within your contract, make your own procedure and set of rules, there are some basic requirements that you have to comply with for your process to be valid. Um, so that includes the right to refer a dispute at any time, the fact that you have to do a notice of intention, you have to provide a timetable by which the decision has to be made and things like that. If you fail to do that, or your procedure doesn't comply, or you don't mention adjudication at all, 
then the scheme applies. So that's the secondary legislation that sits underneath the Construction Act. It's the, called the Scheme for Construction Contracts, which is commonly referred to as the scheme, because again, it's a lovely big mouthful. So we obviously have a statutory adjudication in this country. And whilst I understand that we were the first place to have it, it's now spread. So we have all the territories of Australia now have it, Singapore, Malaysia, and most notably Ireland. So Ireland's legislation is the Construction Contracts Act 2003. And this mainly focuses on the regulation of payments. It applies to construction contracts, which came into force after the 25th of July in 2016. But unlike our legislation, it's much narrower. So you are precluded from contracting out of it, but you have to use the statutory adjudication process. You can't pick and choose and you can't style it in, in your contract. So you're stuck with the scheme itself. And they've limited the disputes that you can refer. So it's only payment disputes. Although unhealthily, they didn't then define what that actually means in the act itself. Um, again, the timetable is set out and it's the same as we have in, under the scheme in this jurisdiction. And what's very obvious is whilst it was a little bit slow to get going, Ireland now has enjoyed, shall we say, adjudication and the numbers are increasing. And it's not only the numbers of adjudication, but it's the value of the dispute that's also going up as well. And I understand from colleagues and those who um, commentate on it, they genuinely believe that this trend will continue and more and more people within Ireland will be adjudicating. And um, we're now also fortunate that we've had the first few court cases go into the Irish courts. Um, and whilst they aren't specifically in relation to enforcing those decisions, it's quite clear from what's being said that the court will be supporting the adjudication process moving forward. And it's going to be quite interesting when that first enforcement decision actually happens. Um, so as Stuart said, there are some advantages to statutory adjudication because you, we can't contract out of it. Whilst we have some ability in this jurisdiction to change the rules slightly, you do always have that baseline position. Um, and the advantage of that is the bargaining power and position of the parties when they're in contract negotiations cannot play a huge part. If we look at the jurisdictions where you only have contractual adjudication, you can see some quite onerous provisions being agreed, I say, because bargaining position is different between the parties. So for example, sometimes you'll see that they can't actually adjudicate until the work's finished. And if you're looking for fast payment, then you're totally defeating the process and the purpose by having that provision. Um, but the downside is we do have gray areas. Like I said, if you want adjudication, but you potentially are a mining or nuclear project, then you need to make sure that it's in your contract. And some contracts go much further. So for example, the NEC, you must adjudicate before you can go over to a tribunal. So both, both sides have some advantages and some disadvantages, in my opinion. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so one of the, the main reasons we, I set this um, session up on adjudication was to have a look at this Motica's case, which came out recently. Um, so, David, um, could you just give us a brief factual background to what happened and what sets it apart from other adjudications? I will try my best, okay? Um, to endorse what Lena said, um, I spend a vast amount of time together with the rest of our team and other construction lawyers dealing with adjudication. It, it's probably the primary dispute resolution process uh, in the UK at the moment to dealing with construction disputes. Um, Moticus, versus Paolo Costelli was an unusual case. Um, it started with the parties entering into a unusual bespoke contract, which with every respect to both parties, didn't really take into account the provisions of the Construction Act. Um, and in particular, it didn't take into account uh, the statutory scheme and the mandatory imposition of adjudication into the contract. So you start off with a contract between a, our clients who are British and an Italian employer to, to undertake works on a hotel in London. And the dispute resolution uh, provisions 
provided that the law of the contract was going to be Italian law. And if the parties fell into dispute, they would have to go to the courts in Paris, France, as it said. Okay. So prior to adjudication, disregarding any other arguments, you would have the parties having a dispute in France using Italian law on a project being run in Britain. Okay. Um, because of the adjudication provision under the Construction Act, uh, Moscus were able to commence an adjudication in England and what they ultimately obtained a successful decision from the adjudicator. Um, we then came to the point where we had to seek to enforce that decision in the English courts. Um, it was no great surprise to us that Paolo Costelli said that you can't do that because the express clause in the contract required all disputes to be dealt with in the courts in Paris, France. Um, and that is where I'm probably going to leave this because Jennifer had the pleasure slash mispleasure of having to persuade a judge um, that the judgment that we, oh, sorry, the decision we obtained in the adjudication was enforceable in the English courts. So over to you, Jennifer. Brilliant, thanks. And Jennifer, yeah. So one of the things that always, which came as a surprise to me, I think years ago when it first came up in, in, in various forums is the fact that you might well get your decision in, in say an adjudication or an arbitration, but then you've got to convince the person who use, has, has not won the case to uh, to pay up. So obviously, when enforcement happens, um, you then have to, as as David's pointed out, get get a decision from a court to ensure that the person pays you. And so that I guess that was what had happened here. And one of the issues I'm just going to raise this now as well. One of the issues before Brexit arose that people mentioned to me was the fact that Brexit meant. Or, or the European Union meant that we could get decisions enforced by courts in other countries with little or no problem whatsoever, um, which wasn't going to be the case post-Brexit. So does the Moticus decision have implications on that front as well? And obviously, if you can give us a rundown of what happened next after David's little introduction there. So as you point out, enforcement is a bit of a vexed problem. And of course, it's no use whatsoever having a decision in your favour in arbitration or court or adjudication if you can't then get the losing party to pay you the money. And enforcement is particularly difficult internationally for the simple reason that unless there is a treaty between the countries concerned, um, enforcement is nigh on impossible. There are some typically residual rules in some jurisdictions, but on the whole, if you don't have a treaty, you can't enforce internationally. And one of the reasons that arbitration is so popular for international disputes is because there is a treaty, the New York Convention, which many, many countries have signed up to, which can make it easier to enforce internationally. In the context of adjudication, it will be enforced by court proceedings in, I think, all or most jurisdictions that have adjudication. Certainly in this country, we enforce in court. And that means that if you are then thinking about enforcement internationally, you have to look at the international treaty position. Post-Brexit, things have indeed changed. And to explain it, I probably need to explain the treaties. So the treaty that governed the position before the UK left the European Union and that still governs the position within the EU is a treaty called um, the, the Brussels Treaty. It's normally referred to as Brussels Recast. And that is a pretty much complete structure which provides for allocation as between the courts of the EU, then once a national court has taken jurisdiction over a dispute and decided it, you can take your judgment to another court within the EU and enforce it. It's a, it's, it's a structure that works well and is, is relatively straightforward. Now that the UK has left the European Union, we are no longer signatories to Brussels, which means that we no longer have the whole process codified for us. We are, however, signatories to a convention called the Hague Convention, 
to which the EU is also a signatory, and there's a handful of other countries, um, Singapore, Mexico, I think Montenegro is the other one. So the Hague Convention solves the problem to some extent, but only to this extent, which is that it only deals with civil and commercial disputes where there is an exclusive choice of court clause or jurisdiction clause. If you comply with those requirements, you can then rely on Hague and enforce your decisions um, elsewhere, but it is only in those limited circumstances. So the big change for Brexit, from Brexit, in terms of enforcement, is that the circumstances in which we can enforce within the EU are narrower than they used to be. As to the Motocus decision, the issue there wasn't so much a question of enforcement, but the first stage, which was to consider which national court had jurisdiction. And the question was whether the French national courts, or more accurately, the Paris courts, had jurisdiction because that is what the contract said, or if the English courts had jurisdiction because we were dealing with adjudication, which is uh, an un unusual um, dispute resolution process uh, sort of on, on, on the world world stage. It doesn't exist everywhere. There, the difference between Brussels and Hague was also important because the Hague Convention has different rules concerning when a national court can take jurisdiction and when it should decline jurisdiction. And in particular, the Hague Convention provides that even if there is an exclusive jurisdiction clause in favor of another country, as there was in, in, in Moticus, um, a different court can take jurisdiction if it's being asked to grant an interim measure of protection. And so the argument in Moticus was whether enforcing an adjudicator's decision which is by definition temporarily binding. It's only binding unless or until you go to court or arbitration or otherwise reach an agreement. The question is whether enforcing a temporarily binding decision was an interim measure of protection or not. And in Moticus, we successfully argued that it was an interim measure of protection such that the English courts would take jurisdiction and enforce, notwithstanding the exclusive jurisdiction clause in favor of another country. I hope that at least at a high level answers the question. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. That so, so, yeah. As with everything in law, nothing is ever simple. Um, and that was a, a brilliant sort of rundown of the the entirety of the Hague Convention and and its implications for Brexit and European and English law in three minutes. So thank you very much. I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. It's, it's one of the arguments, one of the, the criticisms, I think, of uh, that's been levelled at adjudication, and as you can see, probably for obvious reasons, over the last few years, is that it's become unnecessarily unwieldy and complex. And what was supposed to be a quick and easy, simple solution to getting cash flow moving has become a very heavyweight and lengthy system of dispute resolution involving counsel and experts and all sorts of consultants and solicitors and um, so moving on to Sarah as as an adjudicator and a counsel would you say adjudication remains or and or perhaps is an efficient way to resolve disputes? Um, undoubtedly a simpler question than uh, dealing with the Hague Convention uh, but still not necessarily permitting of a straightforward answer um, so I'm still going to fall back on the it depends answer I think on that Stuart. Um, there's a lot of variables mixed up with it um, because uh, there's no just one type of construction dispute. Um, you have simple straightforward interim payment disputes for which actually adjudication is extremely good at keeping cash flow moving um, and costs can be kept reasonably low, um, ranging obviously right through to your very complex retrospective delay analysis dispute um, or professional negligence dispute. Um, so there's not one size fits all. Um, I guess the other point wrapped up within the question is what do we mean by um, efficient? Obviously, we mean cost effective and, and speedy, um, if possible, but um, in comparison to what? Um, because, of course, adjudication has become more costly, but so too has the main alternative of litigation and indeed arbitration. And, and um, uh, so uh, the answer might be that it's efficient in comparison to those, um, but still not necessarily what it was designed to be. Um, I think in terms of evidence that it is successful as a concept, 
uh, there are probably two points that evidence that it is. Uh, the first is the fact that it's been rolled out to so many other common law jurisdictions that Lena touched upon at, at the start. Um, and the second is that actually, generally still, the, the stats seem to suggest that the vast majority of um, disputes that are adjudicated don't find their way into the court system. Um, sometimes that's because the party uh, parties just live with it. Um, and other times, quite often, I think you're finding it's because um, actually there are other disputes between the parties and whatever decision there is unlocks a negotiated settlement to resolve all matters between the parties. Um, and I find that particularly the case where there's been serial adjudications between parties, which of course is um, a lot more common these days. Um, but we all know uh, that, that everything you said at the start is true. It has become more unwieldy. It is more costly. Um, it is probably because it is more lawyer driven in part. Um, and, but, and there is extensive case law um, in respect of adjudication now, which there wasn't before. Um, so costs have obviously arisen as a result of that. Um, the industry is trying to address that problem to some extent by introducing some low cost fixed adjudicator fee schemes. And there's a number of different um, types of those that have been introduced over the last 18 months or so. Um, but I'm not sure how much take up there's necessarily been of those. Certainly I've got no direct knowledge of anybody having used those. I've not been involved in disputes using them myself. Um, but that's certainly something to keep an eye on, I guess. Um, and then when you're looking at uh, the types of dispute, as I say, um, it might be that adjudication isn't best suited to professional negligence disputes. A lot of the time I find those as an adjudicator, the trickiest actually to resolve because they are quite often the ones which have far more hypotheticals in them that you would want to test oral evidence um, on. Um, and I hear far more cross-examination. What would a party have done had they been properly advised? Um, and can quite often involve much more evidence from third parties. Um, similarly, complex uh, delay analysis claims, as I say, they can be uh, challenging depending upon the discipline of your adjudicator. Um, but um, just to finish on a more positive note, um, I think one of the positives is, yes, it's all becoming more complicated. Um, yes, it's becoming more costly, but actually the quality of the decisions, I think as a rule, is becoming better. Um, there will still be some rogue adjudicators and rogue decisions out there, and we kind of all know the normal culprits. Um, but uh, the body of people that sit now as adjudicators, I think, is more uh, extensive than it's ever been. Um, and I think the expertise that the adjudicators are bringing is more than it's perhaps ever been. Um, so um, good, good points and bad points. Um, and uh, it's obviously not faultless. Um, but I think, yeah, as a whole, it's working. Mm. It's interesting, your point about the professional negligence claims being difficult to, to yeah. run in, in adjudication. I, I wonder, it, do you think or do you know if that's the reason why in Ireland they specifically said you could only have a payment dispute adjudicated? I think it may very well be because I think they're obviously trying to get back and closer to what everybody envisaged adjudication was going to be for when it was introduced here, um, which was it's all about keeping the cash flow going. Yeah. Um, but um, look, adjudicators do resolve prof neg disputes um, and it does allow the, the project to continue sometimes when actually if the parties were forced to litigate or arbitrate, um, it, there could be problems. Um, but I do think they are harder ones to, to resolve. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay, and just staying with you, and perhaps bringing in one or yeah. two of the, the other guys as well, is it, looking at technology. Um, has the last twelve months, or even just generally, has life seen an improvement in the use of technology? Do you think things will change um, in adjudication as a result of the, the increased use of things like this that we're on today, Zoom and all of those sorts of things? Yeah, I think they very well might. Um, I mean, we got a very clear very early steer from the TCC didn't we that um, it was business as usual as far as adjudication is concerned um, so everybody has had to find a way to make things work um, and everybody's got quite used to it I think um, I think the uh, the technology that's been employed during lockdowns um, a lot of it I think was being employed beforehand 
Um, so certainly on bigger adjudications, both when I sit as an adjudicator and um, as a party, we've always, we've been used for a very long time to only doing things in soft copy um, and not delivering hard copy documents. Um, having said that, I think we probably, and everybody on the, on, on the uh, call will probably have their own experiences of adjudicators who do still only deal in hard copy or want things in hard copy and soft copy. And for them, I think, this has probably been a challenge. Um, I, 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 and perhaps people can come in with their own experiences on that. But just, be, just before that, I think the only other big thing that I think will change is um, I do think some adjudicators will continue to make use of remote hearings. Um, I've had um, a handful of one day adjudicator hearings, um, uh, mostly as a party. Um, and they have worked very successfully and very smoothly. And I can see adjudicators thinking that that is more efficient um, than everybody, particularly when on some of these, you've got a number of experts and a number of parties involved having to traipse to one common location. Um, so I think some, I think a lot of that might stay. Brilliant. David, did you have anything to add? Uh, I would endorse all of that. Um, adjudicators have been very good at using technology I, I cannot remember the last time we created a hard copy submission and sent it out we're always conscious that we might find the one adjudicator who wants hard copy everything but at, at the moment it's working better than it used to actually if I were honest because previously you'd be photocopying god knows what and sending it all out in the juggernaut um, whereas now you don't need to and just to say as a person who last week had to deal with a court hearing when they insisted on hard copies on everything and they had we had to physically appear you know it's not perfect everywhere in any event mm. cool um so lena i'm going to come to you with the penultimate question um and if you want to drop anything extra onto the, the technology thing while you're there as well that's great but um i think i think i'm right in saying and i didn't bring this up when we were having a chat yesterday but the the reason I've thrown this final question at you is because we had a discussion around something similar um, sometime last year with um, constructing excellence. Is, so, which is looking at insolvency and the Bresco decision last year. Um, do you think there will be more parties adjudicating as a result of that Bresco de decision on on or um, as a, on behalf of insolvent organisations? Yeah, so um, unfortunately, insolvency is a real problem within the construction industry, and you can see why legislation has been enacted for faster payments, and it's why adjudication was brought in. It's to regulate those payments so that the money flows down the line. But ultimately, that all can go wrong. Things happen, and companies do go insolvent. So pre-Bresco, the kind of industry worked on the basis that where there were cross-claims, the insolvent company can start an adjudication. Um, Bresco put a bomb in that, it exploded and completely changed our thinking. So we now know that insolvent companies enjoy the right, enjoy is probably a strong word, uh, to pursue adjudications even when the responding party has the cross claim. Um, I think what that mainly has done is the fact that we do now potentially have the possibility of an adjudication go, going ahead, but it just moves the arguments further down the line. So as um, Jennifer said earlier, the first stage is getting that win, it is getting that decision but it's also then enforcing it if the other side decide that they can't be bothered or don't want to pay it. And that's, I think what we've done is potentially just pushed the question about insolvency further down so that when we do go to those enforcement stages, there's, um, that's when the discussion happens. What, what is the effect of the insolvency on the arrangements of who's paying and who's receiving? Um, I honestly thought within days, we would be seeing a raft of adjudications I definitely, within the first week of Bresco, got a couple of very strongly worded letters, which were very clearly uh, parties trying to crystallise disputes, um, which they previously wouldn't have bothered doing. But none of them have materialised. And when we were talking yesterday, I think that's the case for all of us. Um, so it means there's a lot of different things to consider. Um, when you are acting for insolvent parties, there's problems sometimes with they were in a desperate and dire situation before they went insolvent. Um, they have a lot of pressures on them and it doesn't always mean that they therefore have the evidence that you need to be able to support your case. Um, adjudications, as we've all said, unfortunately, they're, they're not cheap. Um, lawyers cost money, the adjudicator costs money and you might not win. 
And then unfortunately, even if you're able to get that favorable decision, you've got to think about how do you enforce it? Because odds are on that the responding party or the losing party will not be paying it if you're insolvent. Um, so this is where the temporary nature of adjudication comes into play. And as we've seen from the courts in recent decisions, they're expecting some serious security if you want to be able to enforce an award and you're an insolvent party. They're not just looking at what the adjudication award is, but they're looking at the cost of potentially the other party taking that further, litigation, arbitration, them winning and having costs awarded, and then the interest on the full amount. Um, so because of that, I think we may see some strong cases and some strong claims being made, and in the next few years, we may see an adjudication or two happening. But the reality is there's still quite a lot to consider when you're acting for that insolvent party. Brilliant. Thank you, Lena. Um, I, I noticed, David, you've you've unmuted yourself. Did you have anything to add to that? No, I, again, I'd endorse what Lena says, that the, the trick with insolvent situations is if you're for the insolvent party is to make sure you've got all your ducks in a row before you start and by that i mean as lena rightly says you, you have to work out what you're going to be saying on, on the enforcement before you start the adjudication because if you can't win the enforcement it's a complete waste of time but some of the case law gives a hint a route through how you could possibly set yourself up so you can get an enforceable award even when you're in um, insolvency. Um, we were speaking yesterday, I, I was thinking I'm in, I'm in one matter where there's an insolvency situation, but all the money that um, arose from the adjudication award has been paid into an escrow account and the parties are continuing to argue over where that money should go. So there's been no payment from A to B it's gone to C to hold it whilst A and B carry on arguing, which it, it's given, I'm for the insolvent party, it's, it's, it's given us a hollow victory. We feel better that the money's gone out of their bank account to somewhere else. And we're hoping commercially that will be a lever, but wait and see. Interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so finally, before we go to Q&A, and if anybody does have some uh, a question, do drop it into the Q&A box. Um, I, we have one already, and I'd, be wel I'd welcome any more. Um, but finally, um, what single tip would we give to anyone thinking of using adjudication to resolve disputes? What, what, what can help to smooth things and smooth the path? So Lena, if we come to you first. Um, staff availability, especially if you're the referring party, no solicitor wants to hear at 6pm, 48 hours before a written submission is due, that so-and-so is going on holiday tomorrow. Good stuff. Um, Sarah? Um, presentation of your evidence. Uh, think about how you're presenting it. Make it as easy as possible for the adjudicator. Um, and there's two things wrapped up in that. First is if you're doing everything electronically, try and see if you can hyperlink everything or just just ways of referencing things. That's a minor point, but actually from an adjudicator's perspective, so helpful. Um, and a more substantial point connected with that is think about um, the way that how you're presenting your evidence. If, for instance, it's something like um, a delay claim. Um, isn't it, is it going to be a lot more easy for an adjudicator to deal with a fact-based delay analysis than a software-driven one? And some interesting research on what adjudicators prefer and that sort of thing. Interesting. Okay. And David? Uh, if you're the referring party, make, make sure your case uh, is properly researched and presented before you start. Don't do the nightmare scenario of issuing a notice and then run around trying to work out what your case is. It's never a nice experience. And also, and again, touching on something Lena said, if you think you're going to be in multiple adjudications, so adjudication one followed by adjudication two, and it's a huge bun fight, before you start all that, work out commercially where you think you're going to get to by the end and find out if there's a better solution. Because my hard experience of the open quotes nightmare of multiple adjudications is sometimes you end up wishing you've gone to court. Okay, and finally, Jennifer. 
It applies more to the referring party than the responding party, although it can apply to both in a big project where the parties are talking. And it is to carve the dispute up into manageable chunks. So do not, without at least careful thought, assume that an all singing, all dancing final account adjudication is necessarily the best option. If, if you think about it properly, actually there may be a more discrete issue, which is more manageable in a short period and, and will get you where you want to go. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so finally, um, some questions have come in. Um, easy one to start with, um, are adjudications decisions made public? Um, I think I know the answer to this, but Jennifer, seeing as you've answered the last one? Uh, they're not made public, but nor are they confidential. So they, they can be brought into the public domain. Good stuff. And um, one from Alex Rayner. The LVD scheme is excellent. In my experience, it's opened up the process for disputes that would otherwise fail on proportionality when assessing a client's options. Do the panel think there is scope to have a similar scheme for mid-level disputes? Does anyone want to pick that up? So the low value dispute scheme has some exclusions. So usually they look at value, but they also look at, I think I believe it's numbers of documents involved, um, issues, and you, they do have a criteria. And I think the concern with mid-level value disputes would be, it, it may be something that adjudicators are happy to do and the providers and the nominating bodies are, but I think the concern would be that there is a serious risk of you would have to have such a limited scope of disputes that they would happily accept under the scheme because otherwise they could end up putting disproportionate hours in for the fee they actually get. Yeah, I, I'd agree with all of that. I think it would probably end up having to be limited to very straightforward payment disputes. Um, and actually those can be kept, the co costs of that uh, type of adjudication can be kept under control relatively easy within the current framework normally. Um. And I've got, a, there is a final question. I'm not sure if this is the same or slightly different or, or whether it makes sense to you more than it makes sense to me, but I'll read it out and see, see if anybody wants to pick this up. So the panel touched on low, low value adjudicator schemes where the adjudicator caps the fees as a way for lower value claims to be referred to adjudication. Do the panel have any thoughts on how representative costs can be similarly reduced for such lower claims? I know what they're asking. They're asking, the costs of David and myself, that they're, they're thinking about the solicitors and the parties who draft their documents for them. Um, there is possibility, um, as we, we are all legally qualified, but the advantage of adjudication is that you don't have to be um, legally qualified to, um, you can do it yourselves, for example. So you can keep your costs down, but I think ultimately there are schemes out there, um, cost consultants, various law firms have different options available to them, but it's all very specific on a case by case basis. I think the, the only other thing I'd bring in there, and it's quite specific, but perhaps it's worth mentioning, is um, uh, the Professional Negligence Bar Association um, uh, has an adjudicator panel. I sit as an adjudicator on that as well. And it's only for, it's obviously only for professional negligence disputes. Um, but it can cover construction professional negligence disputes. Now, the protocol says um, if you have the option to use a statutory adjudication, then think carefully about whether you want to use the PNBA scheme. But it doesn't say you can't. And actually what that scheme has is bands of fees for, um, the, for, for, for representation. Um, so it does put limits on and it also has the option for the parties to agree in the advance of the dispute. Um, what is going to happen to costs, whether they're going to be recoverable, whether there's going to be a cap, far more than the courts would ever actually be able to do. So whilst it's only an option for professional negligence construction disputes, um, it's something that not actually everybody's aware of is out there and, and does put some limits on costs. Um, so it could be of use. Brilliant. Thank you. Can I just add one thing, yeah. which is in low value adjudications, in my view, the trick is to work in collaboration with the client. So you have to divvy up what's going to be involved. You have to push the client to do as much of that work as possible and work within the confines of a budget. You know, if, if you can do that, it may be workable. The problem with some clients is they say, here's 500 documents. The, the case is in there somewhere. Please go away and work it out. It takes time. It takes money. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's yeah that's great so thank you very much for that so one final question um are expert reports from planners worth investing in if a simple narrative explains the dispute do adjudicators expect them and do they value their input can i jump in with that one um strictly speaking delay is a question of fact you work out what caused the delay and why and so if the factual background as to why a delay happened can be dealt with by a narrative, then in my opinion, um, that, that is enough. The reason that, that people often use expert reports from planners is because in many construction projects, it simply isn't as simple as you didn't deliver the tiles so we couldn't build the roof. Normally what happens is that it will be difficult to ascertain which delays were critical and, and what the knock-on effect of different events were. And so planners are used to try and cut through that and, and, and come up with a way of explaining difficult circumstances. But the difficult circumstances are ultimately difficult factual circumstances. So, I mean, I, I'd be interested to know what, what the other members of the panel think. But from my perspective, if you can explain what happened clearly and comprehensively as a matter of, of, of narrative backed up by documents, um, I see no problem with that. Uh, my part, I completely agree with everything Jennifer's just said, um, both from a party perspective and an adjudicator perspective, that's by far the preference. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It, it's also, you, you have to take into account who the adjudicator is and what sort of information they want to digest and, and frankly are capable of digesting i confess i read some planning reports and you know the sweat is on my brow at the end of it and i'm thinking my god what the hell is all this about and if the adjudicator um who's you know is gonna be like that i wouldn't be keen to putting in complicated reports when you can explain it to someone like me who can understand it yeah, I'd agree with David. If, if you yourselves can't understand the report that's being produced, how do you expect Mr. Adjudicator or Mrs. Adjudicator to understand it? And I think if you can, we always say, like, make it simple, like, make it simple for the adjudicator, make them follow your narrative, make them follow the story so they can pitch themselves the site and see what's happening. Um, and I think normally you can do that much better with facts and documents. Mm. I think that's something that's come out over many of these sessions that we've had in the last 12 months is that the, the simpler and clearer your anything that you do is the more likely it is to succeed i think um and it's interesting hearing so obviously my as many people will know my background is working with um originally keith pickavance the 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 founder of delay analysis and all things great in the world of um time impact analysis and all of those wonderful things um and um there are so many different views and opinions on the importance of expert delay expert evidence in particular and, and the way that it's interpreted and it's it's interesting to hear all those different perspectives and, and to read them in in cases that are published there was one quite recently where um and it the, the the actual dispute wasn't all wasn't really about delay analyst but it was interesting to read the um the the decision makers perspective on on delay expert evidence and all of those sorts of things so it's it's always nice to hear different perspectives so thank you all very much indeed for those those views this morning and the whistle stop tour of the Hague Convention and all the other things that we've heard in the last well 44 minutes we've managed to fit this all into um, thank you to everybody who's joined us today and to all the other previous construction casts that we've done I've just put the link to the next one in the chat so if anybody wants to sign up today then um, please do we don't know what it's going to be about yet so it'll be a mystery it'll be much of a surprise to you as it is to us when we announce what it is but i think our aim is to try and do something a little bit more broadly construction focused next time because we try and mix these up between a bit of law and a bit of general construction and a, and a bit of real estate type focus so uh, so next time we'll probably have something construction focused so thank you all very much thank you indeed very much indeed to our panel for joining us today and hopefully we'll see you all again very soon thank you Thank you.